Hi everyone, this is Eric, and today we're going to interview Dr. Catherine Gro Allen. She's a visiting instructor and SUNY Prodigy Fellow at SUNY Potsdam. She's an archaeologist and a biological anthropologist. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. So, in this series, we try to talk a little bit about the careers that scientists have. So I was interested in what an archaeologist and a biological anthropologist do. Could you explain that to the kids? Sure. Uh, bio biological anthropology and archaeology are two fields within anthropology, which is the study of humans, all humanity. So biological anthropologists study the biological aspects of being human, and archaeologists study uh, the human past, so anything that remains from the ancient past that you can find in archaeological sites. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do within that, but essentially that's what both of them study. So in your research, uh, I've seen that you've traveled everywhere across the world in your research, which is great. That's, that's an aspect that I should actually really ask you about. Um, could you explain a little bit about like what your everyday every day is like in your research and in your career? Sure. So actually, uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to pull up some pictures and I can show you guys um, the specific area that I study and what kind of a, my typical days are like. Okay. Okay, so within the field of uh, bioarchaeology and, uh, excuse me, biological anthropology and archaeology, I specialize in the anthropological study of human remains. So I, I specialize in analyzing uh, typically skeletons or skeletonized human remains, uh, but sometimes that can include mummies as well. Uh, the kinds of skeletal remains or human remains uh, that I specialize in can be really ancient, right? So they can be hundreds or thousands of years old. Uh, and in that case, it's called bioarchaeology. Uh, but sometimes I will look or study uh, ancient or more modern human remains. So uh, people who might have passed away more recently. Uh, and in that case, it's called forensic anthropology. So uh, within uh, bio, bioarchaeology and forensic anthropology, um, our goal is to learn as much as we can from human skeletons or human remains. So uh, the idea is that the human body, our skeleton, is actually a repository or a record of a lot of information about a person. And so we try to learn as much about that person by studying their bones, um, either ancient uh, or modern in forensic cases. Uh, we try to learn about uh, who the person was, so we, we try to build what's called a biological profile. That includes trying to estimate whether a person was male or female by looking at their skeletal features. Uh, we try to estimate roughly what their age was. Uh, also, uh, there's clues on the body that can, that can tell us that. And then we want to learn something about their life uh, and perhaps even their death. So we'll look at markers that might tell us about any kind of a disease, or a traumatic injury they might have had during their lifetime or at around the time of death. So if you look at this photo right down here, um, this is a picture of a wound on the forehead of a skull. All right, so as you can see, uh, it's, it's pretty big. So at some point in their life, um, they were injured and that injury actually healed, right? So we can tell that this happened long before they died because there's signs of healing. So we're not only looking at injuries, but we're also trying to figure out when injuries actually occurred. Uh, this right here, this is a picture of a rib. This is the inside of a rib bone. If you look closely, you can see kind of bumps. Uh, those bumps are the result of, of having a respiratory infection for a very long time. So these are, this is an ancient rib, right? So this is hundreds of years old, I think about 500 years old. Uh, and so there's a good chance that the respiratory infection that this person had uh, was tuberculosis. It's a very common disease in ancient times. So we look at, at signs of disease, signs of injury, and also signs of, of general stress. So if you look closely at this tooth right here, you will see lines in the tooth. Okay, those are, are, are periods of extreme stress. So essentially when, uh, when you're growing up and you're building enamel on your teeth, if your body goes through extreme stress like was common in ancient times, a uh, 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 famine, uh, malnutrition, something like that, they'll actually will cause a line to, to a, a stopping point in the growth of your enamel that will permanently etch a, a line into your tooth. So we look at that to try to understand times of stress as well. So we look at these skeletons and we try to understand something about who the person was in their life and their death. It's, it's amazing. Your whole life is recorded in your bones. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. I'm yeah. holding my teeth over here as you so you know. <laughs> I gotta work on my teeth. <laughs> I don't want any stress lines in my teeth from this. <laughs> well, you so you can't get them as an adult. You can only get these lines as a child. Because you're forming. They're forming. Because you're forming, yes. And then yeah. once your teeth are done forming, um, they they don't change again. So it's only childhood stress that we can see in this, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. Amazing. So in addition to studying the skeletons and trying to understand, um, a lot of times a biological anthropologist and archaeologist is re responsible for caring for human remains and figuring out what to do when they're found. Okay, so uh, sometimes uh, human remains or, or burials are found on archaeological excavations. Uh, sometimes they're found accidentally in construction projects, um, when they're extending the road, when they're building a new building. Uh, sometimes they'll find things that they didn't expect below the ground. So uh, it's my job uh, to be kind of called in to, to handle or to care for the human remains that are found. We have to figure out whether or not they're ancient, right? Or whether they're more modern and we might need to call the police uh, in the medical examiner's office. Uh, sometimes we work to bring them up to excavate them if the construction project has to go on and uh, the people's remains um, aren't able to stay there. Sometimes we help to actually um, rebury them as well. So a project that I worked on uh, in the past, we had to move an unmarked cemetery. Uh, and this right here is a, a memorial because all of the remains were eventually reinterred. Um, I also help uh, with the repatriation of Native American human remains, which is sometimes um, uh, part of the, an archaeologist and bioarchaeologist job um, due to um, the United States laws on, on protecting uh, the skeletal remains of, of Native Americans. So we, we study them, but we also care for them and figure out uh, what to do when they need to be moved, they need to be excavated, or they need to be reburied. Could you tell us a little bit about your own career and what your daily life is like every day? Sure. In your career. Yeah. So uh, I because I am a teacher, uh, I spend a lot of my time teaching. So during from September to May, I am usually teaching uh, college courses on biological anthropology, archaeology, forensic anthropology, bioarchaeology. Uh, and so that takes up uh, quite a bit of, of my career time. So as you can see from those, these photos, uh, when I'm teaching, it's not just, we're not just sitting in the classroom necessarily always learning, we're also doing a lot of hands-on teaching. So these photos right here are pictures of a mock crime scene that is part of my forensic anthropology class. So my students will learn how to process uh, a, a mock crime scene uh, that has skeletal remains um, that a forensic anthropologist might be called in to handle. Uh, these photos over here are a uh, field day. So I'll, I'll take students out into the field and we'll do um, practice excavations. We'll, we'll learn the techniques of excavating at an archeological site. We also do a lot of lab activities. My, my students will learn how to photograph artifacts. They'll learn how to interpret um, skeletons uh, and different kinds of skeletal remains. Uh, so a lot of the time is really focused on teaching these college courses um, in all of, of my fields. Then in the summer is when I get to kind of change things up a little bit. So in the summer I do research uh, and field work. And that can be a little bit different every single year. So these photos are me doing some research in, uh, this one right here is in Hungary. This one over here is in Romania. Uh, so these are both at museums in which I'm collecting information on ancient uh, skeletal remains that are at the museums right now. We're trying to learn more about um, who these people were in the, in the, the ancient period that they came from. Uh, so I'll spend quite a bit of time in museums working with them to, to study and analyze. And then other times I'll actually be in the field. Um, and so field work uh, is often outside uh, and will usually consist of an archeological site um, where we'll either, sometimes they'll have human remains or sometimes they won't. Um, and we'll kind of work to uh, excavate the archeological site and, and learn from all of the information that's found there. Um, so these are some photos of me at some different archeological sites um, around the world. Uh, this photo in the background I particularly like this is the sun rising. Uh, when you're in the field, if you work in a place that's particularly hot, the, the late afternoons are almost unbearable to be excavating and digging in. So we'll start our day before the sun even rises and those are my, my favorite excavation field days because you'll go out before the sun comes up and you'll start digging and the sun, and the sun rises and the weather is just 
beautiful and cool and you'll get to do really neat uh, science in a, like a beautiful environment. So um, those are my, my favorites. So we'll do, I'll do research either in museums or uh, field work um, outside uh, in the summers and then teach all during the school year. So kids, if you've noticed, some of the sciences are laboratory based and some of them are, have a lot of field work. Um, when we interviewed uh, Dr. Nicole Post, she was a geomicrobiologist at the University of Copenhagen as well, and she, she also does a lot of field work. When we interviewed uh, Dr. Ryder, who's the chemist, all of that was on the computer. So it's, see, it's another thing you have to decide. If you're going into sciences, each field is a little bit different in terms of what you end up doing. I think it's really cool to be able to travel everywhere to see everything. You know, you, you, you do your work there and of course you're in sweltering heat all, you know, but, but you also get to meet the people a little bit and, and it's a little, it's cultural, it's kind of nice, you know? So that's fantastic. That's, that, that would be the job for me, I think. <laughs> I, always, I always wanted to travel. That was always my dream. And so I found a way to do that with anthropology, certainly. And there's so many places you can go that most people will not travel to for a vacation. So I think, it's, I think that's a really nice aspect of the career, you know? So. That's absolutely. So when we do field work, it's usually for quite a long time. So it's at minimum often three to four weeks, sometimes longer. And so you get to stay in one spot, some place often very different from the culture you grew up in. Uh, and you really get to learn about the culture. You get to meet a lot of amazing people. And it's so different from traveling you know, for a few days to the major cities or the major tourist attractions, right? The field work gives you an unparalleled experience internationally um, because you just get that time to really feel at home in a place, you know, that you typically might not get a chance to do that. That's so great. I love it. <laughs> um, do you have any interesting stories or anything funny from your, you know, from your career or from your field work or is anything like anything really? So. One of the lures of archaeology and anthropology and, and any science really in the field is finding something truly fantastic, right? So uh, archaeologists are on the hunt constantly for something amazing. The first archaeological excavation I ever went on, uh, that of course was in my mind, right? I wonder what I'll find. I wonder what I'll discover. It could be something that's never been found before. So. On this, on this excavation, we used something, I have a photo here, we used something called um, magnetometry. So what magnetometry is, is we run a, you basically run a giant magnet over the earth and it picks up anomalies below the surface. So these are spots below the surface that it, something's different, right? There's something different in the, in the earth's magnetic field, something interrupted. And in archaeology, if we know that the area was inhabited in the past and we think that there's archaeological sites nearby, those anomalies can be signs of archaeological features or something that you know you should you should excavate. So if you look at this map here that's from that this excavation, you can see these black spots, right? So these black spots are those magnetic anomalies. And so that is how we kind of decided where to dig. Right, so I was, me and a couple other people were given one of these particularly strong ones, right? It was a really strong signal, really big spot. There was something big underneath there that was interrupting the, the magnetic field. Uh, and so we were so excited to figure out what this was. So we started digging uh, and we dug for a couple of days in a row. These are eight hour days in scorching hot sun, extremely dry, you know, punctuated by huge rolling storms that would come in and soak absolutely everything. And then you have to haul water out of this huge, uh, it was a two meter by two meter hole we were digging down. So a ton of labor went into this and down we went and down we went and down we went and we got more and more excited as we got close. And do you know what we found? What did you find? <laughs> absolutely nothing <laughs> what was there <laughs> we found absolutely nothing <laughs> so we do we do not know why the why that spot showed up on the map but there was absolutely nothing there and we had spent days in in huge anticipation tra tracking down what was to be of course the next great archaeological discovery uh, and so I always well, the next think thing you had to do was check the equipment for malfunction. Yeah, right? to, to see what was wrong with the magnetometer. <laughs> 
So it's a, it's a good lesson because I think archaeology particularly, and any kind of, of biological field work or any kind of field work in general, it is the exciting stuff is what hits the news, right? The, the really great finds. But it actually takes a lot of hard, sometimes incredibly boring labor, you know, day after day, week after week, sometimes year after year, to find the truly groundbreaking stuff, right? And so a lot of, of what we do can sometimes be classified as quote unquote failures, but it's not a failure, right? So we're, we're looking, we're trying to discover, we're trying to learn, uh, but inevitably sometimes we come up with absolutely empty handed. <laughs> I was, uh, I was thinking when I was looking at this magnetometer image, this is something that paleontologists are also using now in the field. And they were saying that because of this equipment, it's pretty much the golden age of paleontology. Would you think that, I mean, obviously you're using the same equipment because it's, it's available now, right? Do you think that makes anthropology like in its golden age as well because of the fact that you can kind of find things a little bit easier than, than we used to be able to. It, not like Indiana Jones, now it's so you take the scanner out to the field, you know? But which makes sense, because that's how you find things. Do you think that's true of the anthropological, anthropological <laughs> and archeological fields? The technology that is coming out is absolutely revolutionizing our field, right? So not only can we use things like magnetometry and radar pretty easy and not, to, not for that much money, there's also some fantastic stuff coming um, using satellite imagery, using drones, using something called LIDAR. There's all sorts of ways of finding stuff that uh, is coming from technological advancements. So there are what is called now space archaeologists. They specialize in um, using satellite images to identify uh, archaeological sites and, and evidence of the past. It is absolutely a golden age uh, in that every year new technology is created, not necessarily in anthropology or archaeology, uh, but it's created elsewhere and it is being used in entirely new and different ways. Uh, ancient DNA analysis is revolutionizing biological anthropology in general, right? So um, it is really a fascinating time to be an anthropologist and it's really exciting to think about what could come next. I see, I like that kind of like innovation and. I like the technology. I like it to a certain point, you know, sometimes it's a little bit, but most yeah. of the time it really does help with the research and things like that. So it's, it's really interesting how much changes over time, the way things are actually research changes as well, the way we do research. One of the interesting things about being an anthropologist is because we study everything to do with humans, we actually need to learn a lot of science from outside of our field, right? So when I did um, uh, one of my studies, I had to work with a geochronology and isotope lab, right? And so I had to learn um, geochemistry stuff. And, uh, you know, at other times we'll, we'll use um, kind of, we'll use chemistry, we'll use different aspects of uh, biology and genetics, we'll use all sorts of, of sciences and we have to kind of learn something about all of these different sciences in order to pull it in and to apply it to the study of humans, which is incredibly, will just feel very interesting. Katie, on your website, you have uh, your resume and things, but you also have a quote under your uh, writing. And the quote is from Ray Bradbury. He was an author of science fiction and science as well. And it says, just write every day of your life read intensely, then see what happens. Most of my friends who are put on that diet have very pleasant careers. Could you tell us what that means to you and uh, what that means in general, I guess? So reading and writing are two activities that I try to do every single day if I can. I try to read because there is so much information out there and so much fascinating stuff to learn and I want to learn as much of it as I can. So I read just about everything. And I don't just read about anthropology. I read anything and everything that fascinates me. And I read just a little bit every day. And then the same goes for writing. Writing is something that I think is hard to do and it gets a lot easier the more you do it. So I try to write just a little bit every single day. Uh, sometimes it's only 10 minutes. Sometimes it's only a couple of words that get down on the paper. Um, but by, by thinking about writing and by doing a little bit every day, I have found that my writing has gotten a lot better. Um, and writing and being able to 
you know, write about my research, write about my results, write about my experiences is the best way for me to share my science broadly. So it's important for me to be good at it. So I have to practice a lot in order to do it. So I think that quote kind of helps lead me in my life and reminds me that every single day I should try to write a little something and I should try to read a little something. And I mean, of course, being a good scientist is um, a large part of being a good scientist is communicate, being a good communicator. So yes. being communicate what your research is and things like that. So that's, yes. that's my, thank you. Thank you very much for letting us know about anthropology and archaeology uh, and, and your career in general. Could you tell us a little bit of advice for a child who'd be interested in going into the field in the future? Sure. So one of the, the first things that I would suggest is to learn more about it. Um, there's actually some really cool ways for uh, kids uh, and adults to learn about biological anthropology and archaeology without actually going and getting an advanced degree in it necessarily. So um, if you check out any kind of local museum around you, if you look and see if the Archaeological Institute of America, if they have a chapter near you, a lot of times uh, they'll plan some really neat experiences to learn more. So you can volunteer to work on an archaeological excavation. Uh, they very frequently take volunteers, including kids. Um, and so I would suggest getting out there and getting your hands dirty, certainly. If you can get out there and, and participate in something like this, that's a really good way to figure out if, you're, if you really like it, if you're really passionate about it. Uh, you can do it from home too, actually. The American Museum of Natural History has a really cool website um, with uh, activities for biological anthropology and, and archaeology, uh, but there's a lot of others out there. So you can kind of look into doing stuff at home for right now and then and going out and getting some experience at some point. And then if you really love it and you, and you decide you want to keep going, uh, you can, uh, both archaeologists and biological anthropologists are under the field of anthropology in college. So if you majored in anthropology, uh, or minored in anthropology, you could then choose one of those areas to kind of specialize in. So that would be my suggestion. Another another suggestion is reach out to a biological anthropologist or, or an archaeologist. Many of us are, are, are really friendly and we really love hearing from people. So don't be afraid to find a local archaeologist near you, maybe somebody who works with your state historic preservation office or the local museum. Uh, find a biological anthropologist through any kind of labs or universities near you and send them an email. Ask them what they do, ask them to share some pictures. And I should also let the kids know that Suffolk County has a um, archeological association that they've been around since the 70s and they were started at Stony Brook. And I was looking to them a couple of weeks ago and they're very interesting. They have a lot of local, local history, especially in their newsletter. They have a newsletter that's been coming out since the early 70s. So if you're interested in that, check out the Suffolk County Association of Archaeology as well. So thank you very much for, for doing this interview. Uh, we look forward to seeing what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to keep in touch with you. So if the kids have a question, kids, if you have a question, just forward it to me at reference at elwoodlibrary.org and I will forward it to Dr. Allen. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. It was a privilege.